Hey everyone, Stevie Taylor here. Welcome to episode 49 of the Gig Life Podcast. I hope that you are well. Thank you for being here with me today. Um, I really appreciate it. Now, a few weeks back I announced that I had a new website. Um, it's www.thegiglifepodcast.com um, Yeah, if you haven't checked it out, go and have a look. It's got all the episodes there, uh, news section, photos, videos, um, a news section, just everything you really want to see at a website, I guess. Um, all the social links are there. There's a contact section. Um, yeah, appreciate it if you go and check it out and let me know what you think. Um, anyway, on with episode 49 of the Gig Life Podcast. My guest today is Declan Kelly. Declan is a drummer, singer, guitarist, songwriter and producer from Sydney. Now some of the artists Declan's work for are Bernard Fanning, Casey Chambers, Katie Noonan, Passenger, King Tide, Eugene Hideaway Bridges, Alex Lloyd, Stan Walker, Guy Sebastian, Carice Eden, Stranger Cole, Johnny Osborne, John Stevens and that's just to name a few. Declan also has a bunch of solo album releases out and a few years back he released an album called Diesel and Dub which is a re-release of a bunch of Midnight Oil songs but rehashed in reggae and it's brilliant, eh? Declan also has a new album due out later this year. So we sat down and we hung out in his recording studio in Surrey Hills and we talked a bit about his music, the recording process, a slightly different approach to Instagram his take on the industry, his love for the Sydney music scene, and much, much more. Now, a couple of days before we met up, we learnt of the untimely passing of a mutual friend, Jason Olsen. We do talk a bit about Jace here, um, but we think it's a fitting tribute to the brother. So, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, please give it up for the one and only Declan Kelly. Cheers. All right, I think we're rolling. Declan Kelly, welcome to the Gig Life Podcast. How you doing? Good, man. Um, we're at your studio. It's called The Nest, is that right? That's right, yeah. It's cool, man. It's, it's got a real cool vibe in here. Yeah. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about it. Uh, it's probably about two years old now. Um, set it up with a mate of mine who's a, a gun engineer and um, pretty much designed all the... Uh, acoustic panelling and set up all the wiring so um yeah between the two of us we've um sort of pulled all our gear together and got a I've sort of brought a lot of the instrumental kind of stuff drums and amps and Leslie's and uh yeah oh, where's, where's the Leslie? oh is it yeah I didn't see that I know it's um it's tempting to bring more stuff in but as it's not a huge space we just you know, try and just keep it keep it minimal, and uh, you know, bring in what we need and take it out. Yeah. Do you do you track full bands in here? I have done. Yeah. Um, yep. We've got a little little slot underneath the door where we can run leads out, <laughs> and we, sometimes we put amps in the car. Oh, really? That's parked out the front there, and um, that's great. I've even had vocalists in there just doing like guide vocals, and while the band's sort of cranking in here. And that seems to work. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're going to make do, eh? I've heard of the, the toilets and the rooms and the showers, but not not a car. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I had um, <laughs> Axel Whitehead in the car singing yep. one time. <laughs> yeah, that's... Um, yeah, man. I mean, it's recording's just one of those things. It's just like what you hear is not what you picture sometimes, you know, like 
the mechanics behind it can be, you know, whatever it is to get the results, you know. So, I mean, we're, we're, we're happy with um, just the sounds we're getting from this room and, you know, so it's there's so much you can do with our with within the the box these days so you know yeah that's it eh? um when did you first start enjoying the recording process yeah um uh is that the right way of asking that question you know what i mean eh yeah yeah well i mean i had my first taste of recording was with um a local legend named Phil Punch. He's got um, Electric Avenue Studios. And I uh, must have been about 15, I think, when um, I was playing in my very first band with Alex Lloyd. Mm -hmm. You know, the guy who sang Amazing. Mm -hmm. and, um, but before his... Is that, is that the, that's the Beefs? The Beefs, Beefs yeah. yeah. Um, not the most flattering name, but uh, <laughs> 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 we were like, 15 16 year olds playing rhythm and blues around Balmain and uh, so we got to play a few pubs and stuff underage but they sort of someone dobbed us in and licensing yeah. police stopped us from playing um, but anyway we went in a few Battle of the Bands competitions and we won some recording time with Phil Punch and he had a little studio Electric Avenue in Balmain that had tape machine and um, so that was our first first go. We pretty much just went in, did what we do live, you know, and he put it down to tape and so uh, I mean from there it was just like that was that was the thing that was you know you just get your band in a studio, whack down some tracks, um, but more recently I've just got into you know more production side of things and. So I've got four albums out, three albums, one on the way. So great, I love it. It's my favourite thing to do. I think. Yeah, I was going to ask: is it is it is studio thing or live thing? Uh what you really dig? I I love both. Yeah, I think I I'm sort of at the moment in the headspace of recording. Um, so I love the controlled environment and you know just um. You know, the the art of getting a bunch of musicians to track and get it sounding as natural as possible is it's a real art form. So I'm uh yeah, I've set set my goals to that at the moment. Yeah. But I do love playing live, you know, and touring. Um but as I get older it's one of those things that just you sort of feel like you wanna be home more and I've got I've got family now, so um uh, you know, they they both have their merits, you know. For sure. So how do you find navigating, well, sorry, finding, trying to find the studio work with, I mean, there's that many home studios now. Um, I've got one. Yeah. Which is just my room and it, it's a computer with some, you know, um, universal audio stuff. And, you know, how do you find yourself competing with those backyard people, are you having to advertise? Do people know where you are? Yeah, um, I don't really advertise this. Um, mm -hmm. We sort of, we have put out a couple of tracks that have been recorded here and just from, from that, I've had a bunch of friends just um, want to come in and check it out and eventually record here. So um, I've had... Daniel March hooked up a bunch of different recordings here and Adam Ventura has been in here a couple of times with a couple of different projects with Danny Pliner and mm -hmm. um, uh, and also I think just having a space in Sydney that's, um, you know, a place where you can record drums um, that's treated and engineered by a drummer is i don't know it's it's one of those things i've I'm get, often getting a few calls around the place from around the country actually just people just wanting a particular feel i guess um and sound so 
they'll send me their tracks. Yeah. And yeah. I can just whack them down, like, you know, and, and send them as soon as they're recorded. So, um, and uh, it's a thing. I've, it's not a uncommon thing. A lot of. No, 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 it's not, not at all. But a lot of musicians are doing that yeah. and global sort of recordings. So, uh, yeah, I guess it's word of mouth is probably the best. Like, there's so many studios. There's, there's a lot more sort of, um, you know, probably high end studios than what we've got here. But uh, for a focused sort of, you know, space and if someone wants my particular drum sound or feel, um, it's pretty much set up for that. So, mm. yeah. But in saying that, you, you get other drummers come in and you'll oh, set yeah. them and record them? Yep. Yeah, we've had a bunch of different bands come through here and mm -hmm. um, they all tend to like the space and feel comfy in here. So, yeah. Mm. When you did that session... Um, back in Balmain with the beast. This was before before digital. This was all all analog. All was analog. All to tape. All to tape. Yeah. Yep. Um, so that would have been cool being part of that that era, and I will call it an era because um, I think it would ma it makes you appreciate the uh, the digital domain a lot more, doesn't it? That's right. Whereas there's, there's people like myself who have always had the digital stuff. Um trying to chase that kind of analog analog sound whereas the people that i've talked to that have been in the analog world they like doing it easy like this you know yeah. <laughs> but getting the same sort of sounds you know yeah, it's yeah. True, eh? yeah. um i mean tape machines need a lot of maintenance yeah um and just anything electrical is just going to have its you know little buzzes and squeaks and squalls and um, yep. so in the box just seems to be the the next progression in recording it's yep it's made it a lot more um easier for people to just dial in mm. um and, and it's getting where they're just the tape emulations and yep. all the different um analog sort of software is just it's sounding pretty pretty similar yeah um so but I, I like the combination of the two i mean all the great recordings that i love are all smashed Drums are usually smashed through through tape, um, and there's usually some buzzy stuff going on, and you know noise and room. What are they room calling Artif artifacts? Pretty much, yeah. Audio artifacts, yeah. So I'm sta starting to add a bit bit more of that. Like we do run our all our drums and stuff through a, an old desk, um, so it's going through circuitry and preamps and stuff. Um, so. I've, I love that, and sometimes we even just I'll, I took a session over to Phil Punches again, Ele Electric Avenue, just to run the drums through some some tape over there, and just to get a bit of that. It's not not for every track, but I do I do like the saturation of a tap ma tape machine. Mm. So, have you done a comparison of the two, like say running it to a a tape emulator or? You know, I mean, what what, what do you use as your, your um, like a digital tape emulator? Uh, I've got a, I've got a bunch of the different ones. Like, I just got the Abbey Road one, which is pretty uh, okay. awesome. Yep. Um, I mean, it's sort of even. That's to, the way. Is that waves? It's waves. Waves. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's pretty awesome. Like the wow and flutter and mm -hmm. stuff. Sort of, it's the illusion again. You know, it's just like makes mm. you feel like you're listening to tape. Yeah. Have you used the the slate? I got the slate yeah, one. Yeah, yeah, I like cool. that one yeah, too. Yeah, me too. Yeah. So I mean, they're they're all pretty close. And and then even with when I went to fill punches to run that through tape, it was just the track was like it felt like a sort of late sixties retro kind of vibe. And to put all the drums and and the bass through tape, sort of it did make it did feel like it made a big difference to mm. the feel of the track. But you know, it's it's split in hairs sometimes when most people listen to music these days. Uh, they're not really thinking about any of that. Yeah. But if it's giving off a feeling of that, then you know, you're sort of on 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 the right direction. I think. Yeah, that's cool. Awesome, man. All right, let's roll back to early days, beginnings, yeah. early beginnings. So your you your mum's from New Zealand. That's right. I'm um, living. You were telling me. That's right. Yeah. Yep. And your dad's Irish. Is that right? My dad's, yeah, he's a yep. Dubliner. Okay. Yeah. Um, now, you were born in Sydney? 
That's right. Yeah. yeah. So fr- always from eastern suburbs? Uh no, I grew up around Balmain. Oh, okay. Um so uh went to school just out west, um a few different different schools, but um yeah, mum was she came out here when she was about 20 and um I guess started singing and um playing in bands like not long after that. Uh, she did a bit of the circuit around Sydney when it was probably when it was in its peak time. I think mm. Sydney was just rocking with so many gigs, mm. no lockout laws or anything like that. So yeah, mum ended up being pretty busy and, um, and she was doing clubs and RSLs and things like that and just getting pickup musicians and having charts and stuff just to, you know, do a bunch of covers gigs. Um, so that sort of led me into into music had she was always sort of rehearsing and having different jams around the house and and you know how it goes it just you slip into you know falling in love with an instrument was it drums it it was drums pretty much straight up yeah um and yeah mum ended up my mum and dad were split up when I was really young, so my mum ended up, um, uh, you know, uh, having a relationship with a with a drummer at the time that she was in a band with, and he uh, he you know took some time to show me a few things when I was about maybe eight, and yeah, I didn't really think much of it. I think maybe I dabbled in drums around then, and then sort of put it away for a while just as you do when you're eight and nine and just hanging out with your little buddies. And then I sort of come back to it about 11 um, when I moved to Balmain. And at that time when I was in Balmain, there was a lot of music and a lot of pubs were having live music around there. So um, uh, mum bought me my first drum kit, which I still got. It's an old Premier. Um, so I decided that, that's to That's great to hear on. you've still got your your first kit. Yeah. A bunch of guys I've spoke, they don't have their original drums. Oh, man. Yeah. Well, she, I mean, it's, I it's think because yeah. she, she was dating a drummer, he sort of took her and got... They ended up buying a pretty decent one, which is an old 60s Premier. Yeah. So, I mean, I think... That's is that like the oyster finished one? Yeah, I've seen pictures of. Yeah, very nice. Yeah, yeah, like I had, all the pearl um, marine or whatever they call that. That, that um, that's right. Yeah, yep. some sort of oystery kind oystery of thing. Oystery thing. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I got steel, you know, steel. Yeah. Um, to re sort of fabricate it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I guess yeah, if, if you when you think about it, a lot of kids that may, might get an instrument that might not have a character or is, you know, tonality or something and might sway them from that instrument, yep. you know. So I don't know if that had anything to do with my thing, but... But did you know that at the time, that it was a good, decent... I didn't. Okay. I knew I liked it. I was like, yeah, pretty rad colour and... Yeah, yeah. Um, But probably the juju and the drum might have... Helped me along the way, you know, like yeah. playing a good old 60s premiere. So, yeah, that was pretty much my entry into, you know, the beginnings of music. And then mum sort of found a good teacher for me to um, study with. His local legend drum teacher named Millen. Mm-hmm. He used to teach it. Um, oh, I had drum craft. Drum craft. Yeah, right. And yep. then Billy Hyde's Billy, as well. Billy Hyde's, yeah, that's what I meant, yeah. Um, so yeah, I studied with him for a while and he sort of got me going with technique and things like that. Yeah. Who were the first, the first drummers that you're listening to? Um, uh, it was probably like metal drummers and things like that, mm-hmm. like my school, I used to have a bunch of mates that were like mad about Iron Maiden and bands like that. Uh, so 
I used to I used to get into that, and it was probably more about the also the image of all that yeah sort of darkness of yeah, yeah. that music. So um yep, and I didn't necessarily when I look back, I didn't necessarily think that's what I'd like to be playing because it's a particular flavor that you know I wasn't entirely into now that I look back at it. But um, my first, the first drummers that I really, really took a shine to were probably around Balmain where there was like a lot of different jazz, rhythm and blues musicians that were playing in all the, the pubs. The local guys. Yep. Yeah, they were all doing like the circuit and, you know, well-seasoned veteran musicians. Uh, I used to sometimes with my band unable to go in the pub we just go and sit out the front of the pub and just just we could actually see them through the window and just mm. hear them mm. um so there was a bunch of really awesome drummers there was one drummer that used to play with a band called the bondi cigars um his name is ace follington and he he's you know been around since the 70s from perth um came over here and recorded, played with a lot of different bands, the Hippos. and um, Anyway, he, his particular thing I was like, I really got a lot from because he was more a song player and, and feel. Um, and I wasn't particularly, didn't take a, too much of a shine to, I don't know, more precision kind of players or, or technicians and, or chopsy players. Mm. Anyway, this guy, Ace, was like, probably even now, I've seen him play recently and I still learn a lot from just listening to him. He's sort of just opened the door to a lot of different um, particular feels and, um, you know, just like playing a shuffle and the simplicity of keeping keeping that nice and swampy and funky. Mm -hmm. Um so yeah, there was a bunch of other good drummers around there, but um, so from that, like listening to those older musicians, and particularly rhythm and blues, um, when I was about sixteen, um, the Bondi Cigars actually asked me to come on tour with them. Seventeen, sorry, was when I when I finished high school, and. So I did a little tour with them because their drummer had to go back home for family business. Um, and that was my first tour out of Sydney and was down to Adelaide and South Australia. And um, and that sort of opened me up to a lot of different um, prospects about, you know, my career and whatever. So it was like, I think it was like a, a week's tour and they asked me to, to join them after that um, with a wage, <laughs> like right. 600 bucks a week or something like that. So, and before that that tour happened, I, I remember sitting with my family just going, what, what's, what's your career move? You know, what are you going to do when you leave school, you know? Um, so we we're looking at apprenticeships and I just remember feeling pretty stressed out about that prospect of, you know, fuck, what are you going to do, you know? Mm. This is what everyone has to do, I guess, you know. They've got either got to find a, something to fall back on or find a career, so... Were you always wanting to be a professional musician? Well, I didn't even consider it, yeah, to, yeah. to be honest. Like, I just thought that I didn't really want to be a plumber, which I was looking at, or, was, or a sparky or... Um, um, and my mum, she had a cafe at the time and so I was like doing some part-time work there and I didn't really want to do that. So when the Bondi Cigars came along, it was like, Rah! there's your exit <laughs> out of <laughs> that. And then when they said, okay, well, you, we'll give you like minimum wage of 600 a week. And so, and that was like... What, what year was that? It was like... 99, 
two thousand around then. Mm -hmm. And it was like I think I did five years with them. A couple of albums. Mm. And I think at that time they were labeled like the hardest working band that was touring at the moment like that time because we they'd have two four-wheel drives and they were like traveling around the country um so they'd probably ring and book three months ahead and mm -hmm. design the tours to sort of get around the country keep, so I, keep calling as they go type pretty thing. much yeah wow, so man. i did a couple of laps around around australia um and go into some pretty <laughs> unique places mm deep inside Alice Springs and lots of different Aboriginal communities. Mm, what was that like? Ah, oh, incredible. First time. Yeah, right. Yeah, and it's like when I look back and I just really appreciate that particular time and the way that they were doing it, they're like, I think I think they were just, there was a lot of bands that weren't, I guess, up for doing the miles like that. But um, these boys were just hardened musicians that, uh, went to some places that I guess not many bands really tour to. So it was my hats off to them for, you know, taking some music to those places because you really felt it. Like you go to some mining towns and places like that and that they'd really appreciate you coming all that way, you know. Mm. So that was pretty much my, um, you know, it felt like my apprenticeship mm. like into the music biz and they were all in their 40s so they'd seen they'd seen a, a lot of things and had a lot of experience and sort of just showed me showed me you know good they gave me a good schooling in um you know performing and the or, yeah the business side of things and just that you can sort of you know live off Music, you know. Yeah. How long have they been together since you joined the band? How long have the Bondi Cigars been around? Well, that was sort of like a combination of a few different bands, like the bass player, Al Britton. Um, he was in a band called The Dynamic Hypnotics. Mm -hmm. and they had that song, Soul Kind of Feeling. Mm -hmm. um, so that... And then... Um, and then the guitarist Les Karski he was from a band called the Hippos. So it was just like a one of those I guess it probably started out as like just mates doing a couple of gigs around different pubs just to fill out when they're available type thing. That's right. Yep. But they had a really awesome sound like um that people latched onto and uh, I guess um that sort of took over their their other bands, um, and yeah. So I, I guess before I joined them, they were together maybe two years or something. Okay, right. Yeah, right. Let's just go back a little bit to the beefs. Yeah. Um. So how long were you, how long were you guys doing doing that thing until you weren't allowed to go in any pubs anymore? Or <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I met Alex when I was about maybe 15 or 16 mm -hmm. and his best mate was the guitarist Kinnan. he him and Alex were like best buddies and then my mum used to have live music in her cafe mm. so them two boys came in and wanted to um, play at one of the open nights we had and I was like my mum used to make me set my drums up and sort of back up anyone that needed backing at the time I used to hate that like put on the spot and mum sort of just forced me to do it which is I'm grateful now yeah yeah um so and then Alex and Kinnan just had about four songs that I backed them up and and then that night I remember <laughs> we went to we got someone to buy us a case of beer and we got drunk and we became like best friends. So from then on, we just started rehearsing a couple of times a week and all of our parents used to be mates and pull together and get us driven around to rehearsals. Awesome. And, um, 
to various gigs and battle of the bands and stuff. Um, so, yeah, Alex started writing a few originals. He was like very determined to, um, yeah, early on, I reckon yeah. he was like, I'm going to make a go and write some songs. That, so we're, we're doing like a combination of rhythm and blues and, um, Chuck Berry songs and um, Muddy Waters and like mm. some real traditional rhythm and blues stuff. And then he'd write some really sort of poppy songs as well. So it wasn't my thing at the time. So I think when the Bondi Cigars did ask me to join, I was like, yeah, rhythm that, and blues, I'm going to stick with that. That's and your out. Yeah. yeah. And then w when I'd left the Beefs, um, Alex um, started another band called Mother Hubbard, mm -hmm. which got um, it got a fair bit of traction. I think they they recorded like an album, and then from there he progressed to doing a solo record, which sort of blew up. Mm -hmm. um, so I think his path was always sort of carved out for him, right? From what what I feel, you know. Mm. Mm. That's cool. Um, so how long did the Bondi Cigars thing go for you? A and what was it that got you, got you headed somewhere else? Yeah, so I did five years with them with a yeah. little, little break in the middle. Um, I think towards the end of my time with them, I think it was starting to sort of dwindle a bit. There was a few... I guess all that touring and stuff may, might have t taken it out with everyone. And um, uh, so I think the boys just hung up their boots there for a bit. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're still going today. Like mm. we did have like a, a reunion gig like recently, which was awesome. Like the band still sound as good as ever and it was really good to see everyone. So... They're still they're still playing under. There's two original members that still carry the name. Okay, but um, one of the original members is in WA, so he's out of the picture. And unless there's like a like a, an original reunion gig, uh, yes, yeah, so probably from there. Um, were you song Had you started songwriting at this stage? I hadn't. No, I was. Were you, were you starting to play guitar? Well, I'd always from school. Like I, I learnt basic chords and stuff at school, yep. so I always sort of dabbled at it. Didn't really think much of it. Um, but I think it was when I, at a particular point, I started singing backups and stuff with the Bondi Cigars and. Um, just thought, oh, I, I think I can sing or, so I started thinking about music in a different way. Like mm. maybe I could write and play, play guitar and sing and, um, but that didn't happen for a while. So, um, from the Bondi Cigars, I ended up sort of just, uh, just playing drums with a bunch of different bands around Sydney and it was one band that I played with this brother and sister team called Papa Lips, and we did did a bunch of recording and Papa Lips, Papa Lips, <laughs> yeah. What a sick name! <laughs> yeah, it's an old jazz tune that we, we oh, just right, okay. poached the name. Right, um, I love that. So the brother and sister both sing, and they shared um, shared the lead vocal duties, and but it. Uh, I wrote a couple of tunes that I thought I could sing with those guys and so drumming and singing. Um, and that sort of just opens it up really. Like I, um, I guess when you, it's a real challenge, you know, like for anyone to probably start singing. So once I got a taste for it, I was like, I want to pursue this. So, um, so after Papa Lips, I started just 
just honing a bunch of songs that I'd sort of catalogued mm. and um and then pulled together a bunch of bunch of songs and just started dabbling at recording and just putting some down and yeah, it sort of just opened up from there. Mm. And what sort of a recording rig did, was it like a home recording rig or were you taking yourself into into studios and doing bits and pieces? Well, my good mate, you know Mitch Anderson. I know of him. I don't. Yeah, haven't, haven't met him yet. Legend. Yep. Beautiful singer and beautiful soul. Um, so he was living just around the corner from me, and he was just getting into Cubase and. Okay. So he invited me around and sh- showed me a few little things and sort of just let me let me record on his machine and and we actually did that a couple of times and we put down this one track called Neighbourhood, which is, um, I sort of did an early version with him, which somehow ended up on a compilation record done by Andy Glitra, who was like a Triple J presenter back in the day. Like he had a, he had a soul kind of segment on a Friday night it was like I think it was like ten o'clock at night till twelve, um, and back in the day, probably in the late eighties, early nineties, Sydney was just like there was you know no lockout laws, yep, yep. so people would listen to his show because it was groove based. It was like he was sort of just breaking a lot of. That's kind of acid jazzy kind of music, mm-hmm. massive attack and stuff into, you know, Triple J, which is a lot more, um, a lot more um, underground back in those days. So anyway, Andy's found my track, Neighbourhood, and put it on a compilation, presented it, and I think I was overseas at in Paris at the time, I was just hanging over there and he called me up and said, oh, your track's getting p- played on Triple J, you know, like it's getting, I guess, some medium rotation. Mm-hmm. So he was like, you got to get back here. And f- um, he um, offered to help me finance a record. Oh, so wow. from there I just pulled together all the tunes that I felt would fit into an album and, yeah, he helped me put it out, which is pretty awesome. Grateful, and I did it um, pretty much all on to two inch tape through mixed through a beautiful old Neve desk, and um, so it was probably like the almost the end of that period of analog recording and right. digital was just like right s- coming to the forefront so I was just like pretty pretty grateful to be able to smash some drums through a tape machine and mix it on a big old analog desk Mm. um which felt like the the old school way to record you know Mm. um so yeah Andy helped me put out this record and that yeah from there I just sort of just have haven't looked back really. And yeah. what was that record called? It was called Tales from the Neighborhood. That's Tales from the Neighborhood. Okay, yeah. right. Where the covers half your face. That's right. right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And um, did you get much? Did that album get much traction? Yeah, Triple J gave it. I guess a. I mean, certain songs they'd give a medium rotation to it. Um. Uh, but I f- I feel like it was like that real turnaround in Triple J because okay. it used to be um, I I don't know at the moment it feels like it's it's found its feet in a different kind of way to what it used to be like I don't, I don't really listen to it that much because um, I'm not really taken by what what they're putting out but mm-hmm. um I'll tune in every now and then just to f- see what the lay of think, the land I, I is. I think I know what you mean by that. Yeah, that it, it was almost overnight. Eh? 
it was pretty it much. I kind of yeah. felt that, like it was, um, because my wife used to always listen to Triple J. Yeah, and this is this is before we first met, and then she would keep trying to get me to listen to it, and then I did start listening to it, and then all of a sudden, the, yeah, the music just changed, and I'm like, I don't don't want to listen to this anymore. So, yeah, so we we'll listen to something else. Well, yeah. um, I mean, I'm sure there's some great stuff that is coming yeah. through. I don't listen to it enough, probably, but um, from the general feeling of all my peers and stuff, they've all tuned out of it. And um, like the 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 top, the hottest 100. I mean, yeah, the top 10. Maybe not this year. wasn't too bad this year, but years before that, there's five or six American tracks in there like you know taylor swift was in there and i think katie perry got in one year and and some other rap you know were yeah kind of defeat the purpose i think that's right and i think there's also the thing of i think that album tales from the neighborhood sort of got lumped lumped into this this category that sort of just formed around that time which mm. tied in with the East Coast Byron Bay Blues Festival. Okay. But it, all of a sudden there was like this term blues and roots. Okay. So and Triple J have a s segment called Roots and All, which sort of, I think it all sort of be happened around when Ben Harper and John Butler and all those guys, Jack Johnson, there was a particular sound that was happening. Right. So it felt like there was links to blues, but it wasn't necessarily rhythm and blues. Um, it felt like it was probably live, real playing. But uh, anyway, it got lumped into blues and roots. So, um, mm. which sort of narrowed down, I don't know, the music that I was getting into and where I felt like I was writing from, I felt like that was the only real outlet within Triple J and, you know. Um, so at the moment it feels like it's just gone into, I don't know, it feels like an age thing. Like I know a lot of bands like Powderfinger and, you know, which sort of, had their careers, you know, spawned from Triple J, like mm -hmm. those early Powderfinger records, Triple J just were all over it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but sort of now when you you hear it, I just don't really feel like it, it, there's um, a kind of movement happening or just feels a little on the commercial side of things. Mm -hmm. Um and you notice that what is being currently played or thrashed on Triple J is what um, all the big festivals have tied in this whole circuit with, you know. So gotcha. Anyway, enough about Triple J. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Um. So did you f did you did you feel disheartened by that? To throw throw you back a little bit. Well, wanting you to change direction or you went, no, nah, I'm going to keep. It didn't throw me in that way. I mean, mm -hmm. it did make me think, well, you know, to sustain yourself, do you want to compromise you where your heart is feeling it, you know? But I didn't. I sort of stuck to what I feel like I want the music I want to be playing anyway and how I want it to be sounding. So... And I know there's, I've been in situations where there's A&R and, mm. you know, industry talk and they have this particular jargon that happens that, uh, you know, it can put a bit of fear in artists and make them sort of steer in maybe not their own direction. Can you go into that a bit, a bit the jargon? I'm not quite sure what you... Well, I've been in certain situations where maybe I've had some demos or something and heard just a, a rhetoric that, you know, 
might go in the way of, well, Triple J won't play that or, you know, that's probably not going to work. Or maybe if you steered it this way, okay, it would open it up for, you know, getting it placed on. So, you know, I, I sort of respect some of that and sure. but I know it's just a sometimes it's a thing where it's like business is running the ship or trying to think they run the ship but um it's can can sway a lot of different artists yeah I was gonna say it would definitely it would definitely work yeah I'm sure that stuff works on a bunch of people yeah, yeah I mean you hear a lot of bands just flip their sound and next thing from what well they might compromise a bunch of their fans for you know yeah the sound that they once had yeah is now i don't know a bit broader or a bit more feels like maybe a bit more um geared towards them wanting to have a bit more commercial success, mm. say. Don't know. It's all hearsay, but um. Yeah, no, no, yeah. And then a lot of those cases that that works for them, and they get their they get their commercial success. But but yeah, like you said, you, they're burning fans doing that. Yeah, burning that's the right. diehards, and you know maybe those those commercial fans that you know, they're not going to last very long. That's right. And yeah. And then once that kind of that phase in music dies away, and they try and go back to where they were. There's nobody there waiting for them, eh? That's right, yeah. Mm. I mean, there's been incidences where it, it has been successful and, like, you may compromise some of the fans that expect mm. a certain flavour from you, mm -hmm. but then it's opened up a, you know, more broader base of fans. So Yeah, um, yeah, true. Yep. But anyway, for me, I just, I've pretty much just, I've always just gone for what I've felt on that particular time of my life. And, um, and yeah, that's just the, the music that I've sort of surround or the inspirations that I've surrounded myself with, um, into making an album. So just to sort of always keep that, that goal of what's, happening in your heart and uh, yeah not really compromise yeah yeah congratulations for that that's awesome Thanks. Yeah. yeah I mean you're my, still my, here doing it my last record <laughs> it, it would be an A&R nightmare if there was like s some of their heads if I was to go in and try and pitch it to them right it would be like this it would be like okay well I've got an idea. I want to do this a bunch of Midnight Oil songs done in dub yep. and reggae roots. Mm -hmm. And I want it to be sung by a lot of great singers, but primarily Aboriginal artists that yep. I really love. Yep. Will you throw some money at it? Did you <laughs> did you even consider it? I I didn't. Well, did 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 you yeah, did you get the chance to present that Somebody, this well, is this is Diesel and Dub you're talking that's about. That's right. Eh? Yeah, yeah. I didn't because of that very notion. I didn't want to feel like I had to compromise it, and and just having heard some of that that A and R stuff sometimes is it just it does make me feel a bit icky inside. So mm -hmm. um, before I made that album. My father had passed away, like, um, and left a little bit of his hard-earned inheritance. Um, so it was a bit of a crazy thing, but I did invest a bit of that into the the making of the record. And when I look back, my dad was like, he was always like um, talking about you know, how Aboriginal people were displaced here and mm. he'd always sort of bring it up and 
feel saddened by what was going on in this country. So when I felt like I put some of his hard-earned money into that, it felt like a a pretty heartfelt investment. Um, and and then the other thing was like we were sort of some of the proceedings from the album were going to, towards the Indig Indigenous Literacy Foundation, mm -hmm. which go out and they service a lot of different communities with um with literature and and the, and the chance to to preserve lang language so many different language groups out there so mm. and some of them being in um in jeopardy of being extinct you know from mm. so i felt like that was a good little cause to jump behind and get on board and and then a lot of the singers that come and sang on the album like uh, did it from their their own heart and um yeah so it felt like a real community kind of album as well, you know. Mm. But uh, yeah, that was I was pretty proud of that one, mm. how it all came together, and that was one sort of just talking about following your heart and stuff, and that was just one thing that I just felt like I got to do this, you know, mm. and without compromise, and it ended up. Um, opening it up to a whole bunch of other things that came in from that. Like I ended up meeting Mad Professor through a mutual friend who um, heard about the project and then kindly offered to mix it. Mm. So we spoke about him maybe coming here to mix it or me going over there with the tracks and him mixing it in his studio. So where's he based? He's based in London. Okay. In um southeast London. Mm -hmm. He's got his studio there, Ariwa. So I ended up going over there with um another mate, Richie B, engineer where we tracked a lot of the drums and bass and everything. So we spent two weeks over there with him and mixed it and he gave us a freaking awesome deal and mm. and then we got to witness his dubbings and yeah. his masterful studio. Did he, was he live dubbing? Live dubbing, yeah. Oh, fuck, that's awesome. So not only, like, he sort of just have all the multi-tracks, so he'd, he's a masterful engineer first and foremost. So he'd sort of balance all the tracks and get them EQ'd right. And then he'd just run passes and do dubs of... Yeah, yeah. So he'd do about four or five different dubs of each song and... We just sort of sit and pick the best one, and he's, yeah, that's bloody, wicked, bloody legend. Um, Tikitane does that. Yeah, does the live dubbing stuff. Yeah, he's yeah. he's great. He was another yeah. like I even pondered doing doing the mixes for Diesel and Dub with him. Oh right, okay, awesome. Yeah, mm. but uh, anyway, Mad Professor came along. And yeah, yeah. So yeah, follow your heart. That's it. <laughs> now, um, how would how did you? go about approaching the midnight oil guys for that so yeah it was it was pretty tricky like we mm. had to i guess if you do anyone's songs you gotta by rights like ask for permission mm. um i mean you can record anyone's song it, it's if you um all the copyright is theirs enti entirely so right but we did have to um, ponder the process of like licensing the tracks, which would have cost a fortune. So we sort of just went in the back door a bit and ended up having a meeting with Peter Garrett, who was in Parliament at the time. And he kindly offered to um, waive a his licensing fees for the tracks. So, and then eventually got talking to management, which they sort of, I guess, the, um, yeah, gave us permission to use the tracks. Great. Awesome. So, 
and by rights they get all the royalties if there's airplay and okay um so yeah that was a trip just learning all those songs and getting stuck into them like yeah yeah because uh and wanting to still do the songs justice too eh? yeah that's right yeah yeah because they're um they're not necessarily um geared for turning them into reggae tracks yeah like there's a lot of arrangement to them a lot of yeah. parts and um but we tried to pick a bunch of their songs that would translate easy or as easy as c- can be and just keep the the main elements of each of the songs and and also just about the message like some of the midnight all songs the message is about you know country here and about um displacement of the native people here and um also you know some of the other tracks like armistice day talking about you know worldly issues you know and for me like reggae music has always been like that bastion for talking about the issues of yeah the people you know when you hear marley just get up stand up you know and all those songs he's talking about his situation within might even just be within Kingston, you know, where there was shit going down and people getting shot and corruption in government. So Midnight Oil were, were singing about that here. Um, and it's kind of interesting to hear them sung by the First Nations here, you know. Yeah, like yeah. When you, I got Frank Yammer to sing Beds Are Burning. Frank Yammer's this, he's from out in the desert, out near Alice. And so he, him singing the chorus to Beds Are Burning was like, it was powerful being in the studio, listening to him singing. And, and Emma Donovan as well, singing a, The Dead Heart. Right. It's like, it's one thing I'll just remember to to my grave. Yeah. That's cool. powerful. And then when we did did do it live um emma did most of the gigs and um not only is she just a a solid solid human she just like she can sing amazing Mm. powerful and she sort of takes the message almost to a a new level you know so yeah i'm pretty proud of that album yeah, that's cool. How far did you take the tour? Yeah, um, it was kind of interesting because we had, uh, we had a tour around the country, which was like the minimum sized band that we could do was maybe like ten people, mm. but with everyone that was on the album, it w- would have been about fourteen people. So. Mm. We did did the Blues Fest in Byron, um, which was awesome. So we had everyone up there for that. And, yeah, just getting that many people around, it's a costly yeah. experience, you know. So yep. we sort of got invited to a bunch of different um, First Nations festivals, like Gama Fest up in Arnhem Land. Mm-hmm. Uh, what else did we do? Um, Marbleil Festival in Kakadu, mm-hmm. so it sort of opened this opened us all up to all these unique festivals in different parts of mm. country run by First Nations, you know. So and one of my proudest moments for the album is that it still gets played on a lot of different Indigenous stations around the country, like places you would you would not even know of. Mm. Like they might have one station that services like the space, an area of like a few thousand, you know, kilometres squared, you know. So, uh, yeah, 
I'm, I'm loving that it's getting cycled around to, you know, all First Nations. Yeah. Yeah, that's a trip. Now, you've recently brought, brought out a couple of new songs. Um, that's right. This was The first one came out, was it the end of last year or the beginning of this year? Yeah, it was about three months ago. Yeah. Um, I love the video clip for that. That's that's cool, man. Deep Sea Diver. Yeah, yeah. So where did that concept come from? Uh, well, the guy who shot the film clip, he he's a mate of mine that I played him the track and he sort of just started conceptualising straight away. He was like, dude, I want to make a clip for this. So he pretty much found the Deep Sea Diver, which off eBay. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then built a little sort of underwater set within a like a an aquarium. So he had sort of stuff. And that, that he, fish with the light, that's yeah. spooky as fuck, man. He built that. Like yeah. it just like just like lingers know. around, you know? <laughs> yeah, well that was the whole concept was like the deep sea diver was in despair underwater. Yeah, right. <laughs> um lost not un- not knowing how he's gonna get out of his situation. Yeah. And the the um Anglerfish or whatever it is, the lanternfish. The one, yeah. It was like his little angel spirit coming to. Yeah, yeah. Say, come on, dude. And then the anchor drops and yeah, he's out of there. So that was yeah. yeah Stephen Hyde is the guy who made the film clip, and he's a bloody legend. And he's just one of those guys that just can uh, dream up an idea, and he he did my. My latest film clip, actually. Did he? So he was he was the sitting in the passenger seat filming. That's right. Yeah. 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 Um, do you want to talk a little bit about Jason? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I I found out from your post the other day. Um, I'd met Jason. Oh, maybe four or five years ago when the band I was playing in um, did a couple of gigs, and he he was there. And then he, yeah, he was he was very su- supportive of us and had him, had us in his studio, you know, a couple of times. And last time I saw him was when um, when Cora were in town at the. Oh yeah, yeah. You told me about that. Yeah, um, yeah. That was last time I saw him. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Mm. So yeah, it was a bit of a trip to hear he's passed away. I still don't know what's happened or, mm-hmm. but um, beautiful brother, like. Just always supportive of the community, and he's always um, been supportive of my stuff. That's for sure. Mm. And always getting out to gigs, and I'm just lost for words. Eh, I can't. Mm. I sort of I watched the film clip over the weekend, and just yep. seeing him in it. You know, he's just because that was the last time I saw him was yep. shooting that clip. Yep. So if you haven't seen the clip, it's just like I'm sort of like a yeah for Uber, I'll, I'll, Uber driver. I'll I'll link the I'll link the clip in the show notes to this podcast. Okay, so yeah, yeah. So and yeah, a whole bunch of different passengers. So um, yeah, and Jace is one of them, and him and his partner kindly offered to be part of the clip because mm. I I was on the on his show doing a interview and. On the show, he was like, "Oh, are you doing a film clip? Do you need any, any uh, actors?" And so, yeah, I hit him up. Yeah, and pretty much, he was pretty, pretty keen as to be part of it. So he was like, "I remember him saying, me and my partner, we've gone all out. We've dressed up for it.'" <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I didn't realize. How much? Yeah, they, it's full and on, so eh? I went to pick them up because it's all been shot at night time. So yeah. I went to their place, and they were like sitting on in the dark on their the fence out the front of their place, <laughs> in the <laughs> full hedonistic um, post big night out at Hellfire Club yes. outfit. Yeah, and. I didn't really see them until I got right up close to them, and I, I swear I, sh- I shit myself. <laughs> I was like, "What the fuck?" Anyway, I was like, "This is perfect." Uh, you'll see it. if you see the film clip. You, yeah, you'll see Jace. He's 
He's a beautiful soul, brother. Um, uh, yeah. yeah, I'm gonna miss him. Yeah, fly high. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I don't know if you've been asked this a few times, but I've noticed it on your website that the cranky, the cranky man at your busking gig. Oh yeah. So <laughs> I just saw a bit of the snip. So, so tell me what happened. Tell me what happened that day. So, yeah, I was doing a a paid gig at a like a, a growers market. Yep. That was down down in Manly in the Corso. So, generally, it's pretty chilled, and you know, um, you just do a bunch of sets, and people have just got their trolleys and their baskets, getting fruit and veggies, and um, and I don't know if you've seen me doing doing those sets, but uh, I've got a little amp, and it wasn't particularly loud. I was just playing a bunch of my songs and a lot of reggae stuff, bit of Mali and whatever and so it's not like in your face kind of loud or anything but anyway this one disgruntled old old dude came up to me right up in my face and he was like you gotta turn it down I was like in the, I was still playing. Yeah, it was a mid song, yeah. Yeah, so I sort of just ignored him and kept playing, and then he sort of just and then came closer, and then I just stopped playing, and anyway, it's all sort of er erupted from there. But mm. in my mind, I was like, okay, this this dude is pissing me off, but and then in my heart, I was like. Okay, we we'll just keep calm. Things could just get out of hand. Anyway, um, the guy, he just wouldn't budge. So I, I sort of just presented it to the crowd because there was people sort of gathering around because he was, I was like, and I, I think I remember saying, okay, who here wants music? And then almost the whole market just went, we do. And then... And then there was a guy that came over that tried to push the guy yeah, away. Yeah. They almost had a fight. Yeah. And it's all captured on film by this girl that was just standing next to me. I didn't realise. Um, it was quite a circus. Yeah. Anyway, the guy, is, he he felt like he got into a, a situation that he couldn't get out of. You know, like a little kid that just felt like, what do I do now? And he's, he's stuck. So he just stood there. Um, and that's when I just, I sang right at, to his face <laughs> and it sort of just shoot him off and the crowd yeah, loved it. The crowd it. loved it. Yeah. <laughs> cheering. Yeah. So that little video is on, on Declan's website. So the link's also in the, in the show notes. Um, views with a room, <laughs> Instagram, man, I used to love, love seeing them pop up yeah. on my Instagram feed. So, um, on Declan's Instagram, <clears throat> when he's on tour, you know, if you, you, you would have seen countless people when they're on tour, they've got their gig view or they've got their beautiful hotel view of the ocean and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so, Declan's a, is a little bit, a little bit different. Um, yeah. Tell us a bit about it. <laughs> but it's sort of like a anti um, Instagram yeah. post. Yeah. It's like, yeah, sometimes... When I'm scrolling through <laughs> some of those Instagram feeds, and you just like, you'll see view of the pool or hashtag, hashtag, yep. and then it's like having the best time here, and it's just like palm trees and whatever, and it just feels sometimes it's just like, <laughs> dude, come on, everyone's at work or whatever, and you know, <laughs> so I don't know. It ended up just being. A silly little joke, but I, I think I put one post of the unglamours of touring, which yep. I remember touring with. Um, it was either King Tide or the Strides, and we're all staying in the same room above this hotel in bunk beds. And we open the curtains, and it's just like a brick wall, like <laughs> about 50 centimeters from the window. 
So I was like, all it needed was the flashing neon sign with the <laughs> right. couple of letters missing. That's it. <laughs> and uh, so yeah, I ended up putting a bunch of pictures like that, and uh, yeah, some some is like a portaloo outside. Yeah. Um, yeah, just things like that. Hashtag uh, how lucky am I or something like <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> well, the one I think you're I've, in Perth and there's the two, uh, there's the boxing training going down in the... <laughs> oh, that's right. <laughs> oh. Yeah, that's a good one, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> anyway, people seem to like like that. Yeah, I love that stuff. Because, I mean, if you do put up a picture of your palm trees and sunset into the the horizon, you might get a few likes. <laughs> but if you put up the portaloo outside, man, people dig that they shit. They love that shit. And they start talking about it on podcasts and stuff. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, man. Yeah. Now, you toured recently with Berna Fanning. That's right. Right. So, how did that come about? Um, so, it goes back to I did a. I was playing with um, Katie Noonan. Uh huh. We did. Um, an album with sorry, she played on your um. She's on Diesel and Diesel Dust. And Dust, yep, yeah. So, on one of Katie's albums, she, I think she was signed to Sony, and they um, threw a bunch of money to her to record a record, where she um, enlisted uh, a producer named Nick Didia, who is um. Who recorded all of Powderfinger's records? Mm -hmm. He's from the states. He's got a heavy resume. He's like recorded most of the Pearl Jam records. Uh, Bruce Springsteen. He's worked with him. Stone Temple Pilots. Rage Against the Machine. Like he's he's a heavy. Yeah. Anyway, he was out working with Powderfinger at the time, so he. We got to know him recording Katie's record. Anyway, he sort of kept in touch and he got me up to a studio up in Byron to record Casey Chambers' record, which Casey had got Bernard Fanning to be like a like a spare wheel kind of muso in the in the recording process. Mm -hmm. Bernard not only a great songwriter, he's a great pianist for, you know, playing songs. Mm. Not a virtuoso kind of soloist okay. or anything, but he's great, like, at just comping and, you know, playing the song. Um, and also a great, like, strummer, guitarist, singer-songwriter. Yep. Um, so I got to meet Bernard through that process of recording Casey's record. And... Yeah, during that recording, he'd he'd sort of hinted at his new record that he'd want to start soon with Nick, and yeah, he asked me to come up and record on that record. Oh, you recorded the album as well. Oh, okay. Awesome. Yeah. Oh, great. So yeah, we did a bunch of live stuff first, just to you know get familiar with the the band and the songs, and um, yeah, I've been playing with him ever since about five years ago that mm. all sort of began and um so i've done two records with him now and uh, he's great good good song smith knows what he likes and mm. he um very clear with um his his songs about how he'd like them to be and always gives really good references so when, when we're tracking it can you know it can sometimes when you're tracking and you don't have a direction you can sort of just use your own instincts but it not, might not necessarily be right and then you're wasting time so yeah, um, yeah and uh, I guess the music and songs that he was writing, I was not really playing that kind of music, so it was a real challenge for me mm. to play. What, so what? What do you mean? Well, you, you were doing the the roots reggae type that's stuff, right? right. And, and he was playing. Sort he of was playing music that I was main... definitely listening to, okay. like 
and his influences I was definitely listening to, but um, not necessarily executing it or playing it live, you know. Right. So it was a lot of that stuff is, you know, a lot of it's feel, but it's also a lot of it's sound as well, like the, the way you have your drums and tuned. and So a lot of his references were like people like James Taylor, Okay. Um, Neil Young. Right. Um, Tom Petty. And the real songbook guys. Yeah, real songbook guys. Yep. Dylan. Yeah. So it wasn't necessarily about being like super clinical or I don't know how to explain it. A lot of it was just like just this driving kind of sound but also just f feel, definitely feel, but also just – um, I don't know, keeping it swampy and almost in a Jim Keltner -er yeah kind of way, you know. Yeah. So it was great. It opened me up to a whole other way of playing as well. So when you say Jim Keltner, straight away, the first thing that comes to my head is imagination and definitely outside of the box. Yeah. Um, creative. Yeah. Two sticks in one hand type. Mallet and a stick in one hand, that That's kind of right. stuff. Yeah. So that was kind of the pretty much, yeah. Wow, just awesome. Like, yeah, Nick, the producer, he's he's right into that stuff. He's recorded Jim before, and okay. Um, he pretty much just says like before a track, like when we're sort of just looking at snare drums and particular sounds, he'll just say, "What do you think?" Like and it sort of lets you just open it up a bit. So could be like, okay, well, let's put another crash on t another crash and have just different sounds. So you're not necessarily knowing what the sound is when you play it, when you hear it back, or even just playing a shaker while you're kicking the beat underneath, you know. Mm -hmm. Little simple things like that. So it's just you're still getting the feel of it, but... It's not necessarily convention conventional. Gotcha. Yeah. So things like that. Um it's great. I really I really dig playing like that. Yeah. Yeah, it's fun and and also just trying to yeah, think outside the box of, for such simple songs like that. Not necessarily trying to ch change the wheel or, or invent the wheel, or, you know, just little subtleties that like Jim Kelton is one of the, the greats at it I love the way he you can listen to a particular recording that he's done and not really know how how he's executing it whether yeah. he's overdubbed stuff or he's just he's just like this octopus while he's playing you exactly know? yeah yep so that's, yeah, that's, that's a good way of putting Jim Kelton he's like an octopus yeah just the hands are never going in the same spot. That's Through right. Each so cycle of a groove, you know. Yeah, yeah that's right. Magic. And he he has a a good creative sense to just bust it open in a real subtle way, like just flipping little things every now and then that just um feels like it's constantly moving and. Yeah, uh, yep. But he can slam a backbeat like yeah. harder than anyone. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we just listened to the Travelling Wilbury stuff. Yeah. That backbeat stuff. Oh, you man. Know. It's amazing, that yep. stuff. Mm. But uh, yeah, he's he's one of the one of the greats I always listen to. Mm. What are some of the other American or even, even um, English drummers yeah. that you've kind of latched on to? I mean, when I was playing with the cigars, they opened me up to a lot of different drummers that I probably would have never have known at the time. I might have heard them on different records, but not known. But yep. um, people like, is it Jim Gordon? He used mm -hmm. to play with Joe Cocker. and. Um, Did you hear the Jim Gordon story? You heard his story? No. So he went, he went psycho and killed his mum. That's right. I and heard that. And now he's in jail. Yeah. 
Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah I heard that. Yeah. It's kind of sad, isn't it? Um, yeah, the cigars also opened me up to, like, bands like The Meters and stuff. So Okay, Zigaboo. Zigaboo. <laughs> I, like, I became really obsessed by him, actually, yep. and... I would like sleep with my headphones on, listening to <laughs> meters on repeat. Awesome. Mm. I mean, all the the early James Brown drummers, Jabbo Starks and Clyde Stubblefield. Yep. I became obsessed with them. Um, yeah. I mean, at the moment, I sort of, I've been digging also in the Jim Keltner kind of feel like, People like Jay Belarus, you know him? I've heard that name. He's like, he's one of these guys that just has beautiful old drums, sometimes with calf skins and things like that. And um, just an awesome song player, T-Bone Burnett, uses mm -hmm. him a lot on a lot of the productions that he, he does. Um, so people like that. And then, you know, I always love the creativity of, like, reggae music. And some of those influential reggae drummers like Carlton Barrett and Leroy Horsemouth, um, Sly and Robbie, just the way that they sort of almost, like, flipped what was probably like rhythm and blues and an early soul music and then mm. flipped it into, um, yeah, what we know as reggae music. Yep. It's always like pretty um, amazing, mm. that music. Yeah. Because it's so influential now worldwide, like, um, and that, that particular, the elements of reggae music is, it's deep. Like when you hear Carlton Barrett and his brother just locking down some of those Marley songs, it's like he's also not not really knowing what's going on. Yeah, I was talking to a guy a couple of months ago, Joel Shedbolt. He's a guitar player. He plays in a band called Lab in New Zealand. He is also part of the the Marley All Stars band in New Zealand, and um, I asked him. Well, you know, we started talking a bit about that, and I asked him what it was like to get into that music, and he said, "Man, there's just so much that that almost like a masterpiece. Every song, and every song's got its part, you know, and and everybody in that band had to learn that part because if they didn't play that part properly, the song didn't sound very good. You know what I mean? Yeah, just like a real, real art to it, real masterpieces. That's right. These songs yeah, were, you know. Yeah, it's like, it's like. You know, within each culture, there's a the music that, you know, defines that particular culture or tribe or whatever, you know. It's, yeah. Uh, when you hear stuff like Cuban music, there's like the clave and, mm -hmm. um, and then the particular rhythms. And then that even goes back further because like there's all the slave mi migration that brought over the rhythms from Africa that mm. would have been probably passed down in secret and then you know developed within the oppression that they were they were living in you know so when you hear reggae music it's it's so deep uh, you sort of feel it most people probably don't even ponder it but when I hear it some of that early Mali stuff, you, or even before that, like the when you hear the Rastafarian Naya Bingi chants, you just I hear the slave migration harmonies right. and this I don't know high connection to the higher forces. You know, it's crazy, and and then when you hear the connection that that's had in Aotearoa and like how they, you know, made a uh, a bond with it and adopted it into the music back home. It's yeah, like, it's still there now. It's big now. Still, it's, yep. it's huge, isn't it? It sure is. 
So, yeah, spiritual. Yeah, man. Who are the local, some of the local players that kind of blow you away, that are kind of doing something special, something different? Yeah, I mean, Sydney's got no shortage of amazing musicians, that's for sure. You know that. Um, I mean, it's there's a lot of different different scenes that are happening here like and I don't know like bands like God Tet with Tully and all those guys they're they're like you know they're, they're sort of like forward thinking musicians they're thinking future music that's right so I dig that aspect but then there's also like real like heavyweight players like I, I love watching Simon Barker and players like that that just you know they've got their own unique thing as well and um, yeah I mean since like writing my own songs and stuff I just you sort of develop like who you'd like to have play on your on your stuff later? Yep. So on my new record, I've got a whole bunch of different different players. I'm playing a bunch of it myself, but um, mm -hmm. I've got Adam Ventura. Always, you know, seems to just be able to come in and just like blow me away. Um, Danny Pliner, beautiful keyboard player, keyboard Danny. Player, yep. Just, I mean, my thing is like people that can, that either have a particular thing, like that they're, um, you know, really great at that can add to a track. So I think for my new record, I've, I've put down the drums, sometimes the bass, usually the rhythm parts on guitar and most of the vocals and then for like those real subtle flavors like that can just be like almost a, just like a a color coloring kind of palette like yep. people like um Danny March I've got Daniel March on a couple and um another guy that lives in Melbourne now Cameron Dale he's a amazing guitarist from he's from he's from Wellington actually um mm. Just that can just add in a unique bunch of whack sounds that can just, you know, be um, almost like their own little masterful pieces within your track. Um, so, yeah, did, uh, there's so many great players to choose from here. It's yeah, like there is a. <laughs> you don't want to. Have not not say somebody and yeah that's right yeah <laughs> it's a probably it's a pretty tough question but I think yeah I think you've answered it well but, uh, yeah Sydney I mean it's quite fascinating that Sydney's going through a bit of a I guess a a lull in live music terms lockout laws you know have affected gigs and. Um, you know how it is. Venues are finding it hard to override one guy in an area that might want to shut it down for the noise complaints, you know. Um, but above all that, there's so many wicked musos here that are just like doing it. They're just finding paths. Finding ways to yep. do it. There's a few little underground things. There's people yep. like that have got their little situations going on, recording setups and... You know, I was listening to your podcast with the with the bass players, and as Victor Round said, musos are like cockroaches. Cockroaches, man. Yeah, yeah. You know. Yeah. <laughs> and they just get off, dust themselves off. That's it. Victor, that was legendary, man. Yeah, man. That is exactly the way we are. We just have to, for whatever, however we have to do it, you got to just follow it through. You know. Whether it, you know, is you're not necessarily may, might be doing your favourite gigs all the time, but you got to just be in it. 
That's it, eh? Yeah, and when you're playing with some of your favourite players and, you know, it's it's a real blessing, but when you're playing with new players and you always got something to learn somewhere, yeah. you know? Yeah. You've got to be creating places for the new up-and-comers to be able to play. Not not pl Maybe not venues, but... There needs to be environments and, and like you said, situations. Yeah. That's a good way of putting it. There's all these new, you know, situations going on. Um, That's right. Yeah, I mean, I always feel for the younger cats. Mm. When I was their age, Sydney was like, there was gigs, you know. There yep. was like situations you could, you know, get yourself into. Yep. Um, and now it's just about like seriously adapting to what's going on at the moment and yeah, you have to eh? yeah um i'll come across people that are totally adapting creating their own situations but there's also people that are sitting back and pissing around and complaining yeah uh waiting for it all to go away so they can go back to the way that it used to be that's, that's right. not gonna fucking happen man no you know? no well, a lot of those complainers aren't really going out and checking out there's there's a lot of stuff go, that goes on in Sydney. Like, I try and do my best to get out and see what's going down and support and uh, and there's some. I think also just having that disadvantage in this town. Like, you know, Melbourne seems to has had this thing of like, oh, we've got so many gigs happening here. Like, I was down mm. there on the weekend and okay. uh, a few of the museums that were like. Yeah, man, you should move here. It's happening. So good. And, but up here, it feels like there's a definite struggle that happens within. It's not a, not like a, we're at, in a civil war kind of struggle <laughs> yeah. or anything. Yeah. But there's a definite, like, artistic <laughs> war going on within establishment, government, and, um, you know, outlets, like, we need to use that, um, that energy that, that struggle's creating to be making stuff. Yeah. You know, because that, I think that's where a lot of the best music is made from some sort of struggle, you know, it's like, um, and I, I love this town, so I'm sticking it out. Yeah, yeah. Optimistic about it, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now, when's the new album coming? So, the likely time for release is probably September. Cool. Yeah, so I've got a few more mixes and then, yeah, ready to mm. put out another record, which is kind of weird in itself, like how to how to do that these days. Mm. So, do you have a plan for that? Uh, well, I've got like a label that, I've been working with for the last okay. bunch of bunch of songs and so they're going to help me put it out and um is it an in independent label? It's an independent label source yep. music. Okay. Uh so we've spoke about how we do it like do you do CDs or do you mm. do just do streaming and mm. do you do an album versus single 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 single? Yeah, do you all do that. EPs, all that kind of th it's sort that of kind just, of stuff. It's a bit of a free for all at the moment, but yeah, I mean, I tour with a bunch of independent acts, drumming for them, and a few of them have a little su successful kind of merch thing where they're just still okay. selling a bunch of CDs, not not as much as back in the day, but vinyl seems to be, mm. you know, a thing people. People are buying vinyl. It's a lot more expensive, but but so, that's that's fine. Yeah, if, if you're you know, a big if you're fan. getting half the amount of people, but you're selling it for twice as much, you're still making the same amount of money. Hey, yeah, mm. uh, and then streaming. So mm. once that finds its feet, I think musicians and songwriters will hopefully get reimbursed with um yeah with monies that they're well and truly owed like I was just thinking about it the other day like if you go to a shop 
and say you go to the butchers and say, okay, I, I want that bit of steak there and I'm not going to pay for it. I'm going to, someone else is going to give you some money down the track. <laughs> Hopefully. I don't know. It's, it's pretty much, that's how it is Yeah, for us musos and songwriters at the moment. Yeah. You put our stuff on a streaming surface, it's getting heard, which is awesome. Mm. Well, hopefully getting heard. But what is it? Point zero zero yeah, six that, cents? And that's that? that depends who it is. I think the machine is like well and truly on its way, like it's you know, how many people are on Spotify? Is that millions? Yeah, yeah. I mean you know why why, why would they, why are they going to change it yeah pretty much it's like cool free music i'm going to pay for my subscription 13 bucks a month and yeah just gobble up as much music as i can mm -hmm. um and that's just the way it is at the moment but it's definitely someone's pocketing from all that you know yep um and it's definitely not uh Definitely not musicians, that's for sure. No, nah, I mean, back in the day, you could tour and sell CDs and be able to sustain yourself and mm. make a living. Mm. But at the moment, it's just like the prospect of touring is like, is uh, daunting. Oh, right, is it? A little mm. bit, yeah, for an ind independent artist. They gotta, yep. They don't have backing. They got to pay for it all themselves. And mm. it's not cheap getting around and touring. Mm. So... Who knows? It's it's an evolving platform, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Well, Declan Kelly, thanks Man. so much for for um, having me at your studio today and sitting down and chatting with me. And it was bloody good, man. It was a pleasure, man. Really, really enjoyed it. I really um, dig your podcast, man. Thank you, man. What Thank you me. what you're doing? Yeah. In, in these times of how Sydney's going with its live music thing it's uh, i think it's an important thing to to highlight all the talent here that you know have been doing it for years like mm. battling and mm. um just being a musician is uh it's a it's a unique thing you know mm. so good on you for thank you man thank for you capturing that thank you and i'm and i'm also also um chatting to up and comers as well you know i'm just i'm starting to do that now to get there cuz it's interesting hearing their take on it because they only know it this way at the moment yeah you know um yeah and it'd be interesting if i ever get to talk to them in another 10 years how much the industry's changed you know yeah, yeah that's it's right it's fascinating just it's, uh, document it as much as i can you know yeah. That's right. Uh, who knows where it's going to be? Yeah. Virtual gigs. Yeah. Virtual <laughs> Hologram gigs. Holo hologram gigs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, classic. All right, Declan. Cheers, my man. Cheers, brother. Right. Later, brother. See ya. Catch up.